Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, a government and political correspondent, and it is uh, election year and election season. We're past the primaries. And uh, our guest today is incumbent assembly person from the 30th district, Shannon Zimmerman. Shannon, welcome back to the show. Jamie, thrilled to be here as always. Thank you for the invitation. You bet. Well, Shannon, you're a veteran of the show. And mm -hmm. so I would like to uh, give you that opportunity that we have in the past to just give, catch folks up a little bit on your background and then we'll get into what it's like to have been assembly person for a couple of terms and so forth, yep. all right? Okay, well, um, first of all, um, you know, I had no aspirations, really, uh, no affections to ever uh, run for office. This uh, kind of came up, if you will, in 2016. So I'm in my second term, as you mentioned. But my background leading up to that, um, I come from the most modest beginnings, uh, born and raised in Wisconsin, uh, lived here all my life. Um, I am as Wisconsin proud as anybody. And um, you know, growing up um, without a lot, uh, I had to get my jobs early and young from paper routes to back then we threw square bales of hay. Now they have the big round uh, bales that uh, look a lot easier. But, um, you know, started a business with my wife in River Falls in 1996. Uh, that company would grow dramatically. We were, uh, we were very blessed, uh, really. We were very blessed. Um, recognized as St. Croix County Large Business of the Year. Uh, one year uh, at our peak, we employed over 300 people uh, in the area and then also some additional people internationally. So um, a lot of business background and as a part of that, I got to see a lot of the challenges that, that businesses face, that uh, employers face, employees face. Um, coached football for seven years in River Falls, raised our kids and now our grandkids here. So for me, the notion of running for office was more about fixing things, removing obstacles, applying a bit of common sense business mentality to what I viewed as, you know, kind of a large bloated, maybe not as functional organization in government. Okay. So that's the background, and you mentioned second term. So has it yep. been already uh, four years since you were first running? We're coming up on the four-year anniversary. That is correct. Okay. Now, um, so with that background and highly successful in business, uh, what is motivating you to want to stay in government, uh, the public <laughs> sector, after having now two terms in the public sector? Yeah, I kind of ask myself that question sometimes as well. Um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. I have been a firm believer in term limits. Um, I don't believe people should make careers out of, out of serving their communities in, in uh, political offices. I have the same intentions. I, I don't mean to do that. But there are some things that I want to finish up. There are some things I want to get done. Uh, just a couple of them. So, you know, looking at life through the lenses of finance for a second, when, when, the, when the economy is strong, when families are working, when, when uh, that's happening, kids are being taken care of, our communities are strong, and it's a circle that, that is just so helpful and so beneficial. And what I see as an opportunity here, we have, for example, uh, three th great things in our area. Number one, we have fantastic schools from our K-12 schools, our technical colleges, and our university. We have exceptional employers in this area, innovative companies that you never would imagine are living in the shadows in St. Croix and Pierce County. We also have exceptional people in our area. And I've long had a vision that there's, there's a more efficient and optimized way to kind of bring all these things together where everybody wins. And it starts with a couple different things. First, uh, some unfinished business. There's some work that my colleagues and I have initiated looking at some new, uh, we believe are very creative ways to um, more sustainably fund our, our K-12 schools, uh, our, our, even our higher education schools, while still offsetting some of the property tax, which is a big complaint I hear from a lot of people in the area. The more money we can keep in the pockets of our neighbors, the better off they are. And ironically, uh, they spend it. They put it right back into our communities and so forth. So that's going to be a big one for me. Last, uh, last term, uh, as you know, it was uh, recorded in the, uh, in the local paper, you know, it was, a, it was a late evening until midnight uh, from a hotel room in Madison. I was working with the UW River Falls Chancellor, um, and I was lobbying my colleagues on the Joint uh, Finance Committee for funding for the phase one for the university's science and technology uh, building. 
This is a building that will foster innovation uh, within our area, but our area is adjacent to a, a major metropolitan. That is a bit of unfinished business that I'd like to complete before I conclude my terms uh, serving our, our neighbors. Um, so just a little bit more on that last one. So what yeah. is it that you think needs to be done to make it come to fruition? So the way the process works is the initial funding, which was $2 million, are funds that are set aside to do a comprehensive design, the blueprints. It's all of the, the preparational work before we put you know, shovels in the ground. It's very necessary. It is very unusual, if not almost never happens, where you're going to get a project uh, funded if the, this work hasn't happened. By virtue of this being accomplished, it advances the project further into the queue. So the probability uh, goes up of the overall project being approved. Now, states uh, obviously moving through some challenging, potentially financial times, uh, but I see the strategic value. Look, I'm a, I'm a proponent of education because education supports our workforce and our workforce supports our employers. And so we have to make sure we're looking at all of these different things. Science and technology is the future. Uh, you know, our local university has picked up, I mean, we have a program in data science now at River Falls. Data science is going to drive so many industries as we go forward. As a for, you know, former uh, software engineer, I can attest to that fact. So to me, uh, this level of strategic investment is important both for us locally, but it is also important to us from a state standpoint. Okay. So you, uh, I, as an incumbent, you've got a record um, that you can point to. And yeah. uh, whereas challengers, you know, are trying to convince the public that uh, there, there needs to be a change. So what is it about the last four years that you are proud of and that you feel shows um, a reason to, for folks to reelect you? Yeah. So I'm going to point to some things that I want to make sure I say on the outset. I'm not taking sole credit for it. There are many, many people both within the state of Wisconsin and across the nation uh, that I think that uh, deserve the, the, the credit for a number of these things. But I'll tell you, you know, prior to COVID, look around St. Croix County. Our unemployment was hovering around 2%. Our, our greatest challenge were, uh, was the fact that employers were struggling to find workforce. So we were devising new and creative ways to, to recruit and bring workforce in here. So it's difficult for me to look around our neighborhoods, you know, holistically and say, all is awful in the world. It's imperfect and it can certainly improve, but it is definitely my job and my mission to make sure that we get back on track and back to those days as quickly as is possible. And I think that the background as an entrepreneur um, and, and facing all the challenges uh, that one does, I mean, you know, no business plan ever went as scripted and you have to adapt and adjust. And we're gonna be doing the same thing. We are doing the same thing right now. But uh, we have all the ingredients, all the makings, especially in Western Wisconsin, to be on the leading edge of the recovery across the state. So, you know, when I look back at the things that we did successfully, um, we sent record funding to our K-12 schools. We sent funding also for those kids with special needs, which frankly, I was surprised that it hadn't been done in so many years. That's an important part. You know, I have visited uh, those in our community that have kids that have unique needs. This is a real issue and I was proud to be a part of that. I mean, I, I, I spent a lot of time speaking with a lot of parents and a lot of kids uh, in, in our community. So I'm proud that, to do that. I wanna to continue to do that. I wanna see the university project, as I mentioned, finish. I wanna work across the aisle with my colleagues there who have the acumen to understand that bigger government is not the answer. We can optimize. I will tell you as a member of joint finance, there are substantial areas of cost savings and cost reduction in government that will allow actually, and to the person I'm speaking with, more money to make it to the classroom than is consumed right now in Madison. Those are the things, the common sense things that I want to finish and look back and say, I made a difference for my community. Okay. Now, you mentioned about working um, across the aisle, and um, I think that was one of your opponent's criticisms that you're voting straight party line and so forth. But uh, before we went on the air, you mentioned how you got more legislation that you either co-sponsor or authored past this last term under a Democratic governor than you did uh, previously. So can, can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's one thing to get it passed uh, in a Republican assembly, but it's another to get a Democratic governor to sign it. 
Yeah, I had more bills signed into law during this term than my first term. So with a Democrat governor, I had more bills signed into law. I have, uh, I have worked across the aisle. Each one of the bills that were passed were bipartisan supported. Um, I, I, and they ranged, right? The, the bills ranged from um, Representative Jason Fields and I. Uh, work together. Jason has a, an investment background, business background. We work together on renovating a statute of law that makes it easier for companies to invest in Wisconsin businesses. That's the more of the economic side of me coming out. Uh, alternatively, uh, drafted a bill that was later signed into law, which removed uh, an absurd uh, chap rule uh, in law for those with disabilities who are trying to vote, but they can't speak their name. Uh, so so the, the range and the diversity of the bills and the fact that they are bipartisan are illustrative of the fact that I do work across the aisle. Now, I am a conservative, Jamie. I'm a fiscal conservative, and naturally, you're going to see th some of those patterns come out because I will always believe that the Hudson residents, the River Falls residents, those who have earned their money are better stewards of their money than government is. And so you will see that pattern emerge. But I forget the exact statistic. It's going to be, it's in the mid-90s, I believe, of all the bills that were passed on the assembly floor this past session were bipartisan supported. So... I close with this. If we use Facebook, if we use social media, or sometimes even both the state and national media as, as, as our barometer for what really happens in Madison, it's wrong. I have sat in the parlor uh, while we are in session and had exceptional conversations. I consider countless Democrats there my friend. So friends, I, I just think that it's not as dire. Certainly I can speak for the state of Wisconsin as one may conclude. Well, let's uh, talk about that because uh, you're on the inside of the legislature there and mm -hmm. getting constant updates. Um, it was looking really bad in, you know, early April when the case mm -hmm. was being made against the governor's shutdown and so forth that this is going to ruin the state and so forth. So now that we've had four more, five more months since early mm -hmm. April, we're now in September. Sure. Uh, what are the projections looking like? Uh, for uh, us coming out of this? And uh, what would you say are the prospects for any kind of um, budget repair bill uh, following the election? Good question. Um, fiscal recently re uh, released some of the revenue numbers, uh, preliminary revenue numbers. And the good news is that if ever there was a, a, a great position to be in, in such a challenging time, Wisconsin was probably in as good a position as we possibly have could have, you know, have been in. Um, you know, our rainy day fund uh, was extremely high and in fact, even increased. And so while that doesn't cure all, it puts us in a better position than some of our neighboring states, for example. At this time, we have not been alerted to the fact that we're going to go in and, 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 and trigger the budget repair bill process. That said, I think the concern probably lies out in 2021, when some of these things may catch up with us a bit. Again, I think that the options for uh, using the rainy day fund, I think the options for further cost reduction in uh, I'll say administrative or overhead areas are probably uh, um, opportune for us. And there are things that we can be doing there so that we minimize the impact on those in our community. Because the worst thing I believe we could do right now is increase taxes on our neighbors when they are already, you know, either still in a difficult way or just coming out of a difficult way. That's not the way we're going to make their life better. We have to actually make sure that more of their money is theirs as they go forward. Well, thank you. I mean, that, it's good to hear something reassuring because being on a school board and uh, next Monday, we uh, go to the public for our annual meeting, talk about a tentative uh, uh, um, mill rate change. Uh, we're projecting a decrease, mm -hmm. but um, by the same token, it's a little scary because we don't know where the state aid is going to necessarily fall until October. And that's when we have to officially set our yep. tax lobby. And so to piggyback on your comment, to raise taxes, and we'd have to raise property taxes, if you could reconvene as a legislature and decided we're going to have to take away some of that K-12 money that we put in there because we need to repair a big deficit in, in the budget. And so it's going to force us to raise taxes mm -hmm. on property taxes. So you don't foresee that happening in this next three, four, five months. So 
Obviously, I, I can never say never because there could be events and things that unfold or things that we later discover. Um, Legislative Fiscal Bureau is a group. They're essentially Wisconsin's accounting agency, if you will, nonpartisan agency, and, and they keep us surprised. But at this point in time, it is appearing that we will not trigger the budget repair bill process during 2020. Okay. But then uh, you get re-sworn in um, for another term in yep. January, and then you guys start it back up, correct? Yep. For that is correct. Biennium budget. Exactly and that's correct. that's when you're saying it's usually these two-year cycles, right? Yep, that is yep, exactly correct. And, and we're bracing ourselves for that. We're trying to do good conservative fiscal planning in our school district to you know, try to uh, have that rainy day fund sufficient so that if there are going to be cuts, uh, we don't have to raise property taxes to address that. So yeah. So I want to actually compliment um, Hudson School District, River Falls School District, our, you know, St. Croix Central. Um, I have had many conversations with our superintendents. Um, I think they would all say that uh, I reach out to them or they reach out to me on a very regular basis. I've spoken with them about the budgetary process. I've given them updates whenever, you know, we learn something new. And I want to actually say, and I want to make sure the people in our community know and understand this. Those folks are doing a great job managing the bank right now. They know that we're in tough times. You know we're in tough times. And the measures have been taken to help reduce, prevent as, as much of the adversity as possible. So you've done your part. I will do mine. And uh, hopefully we don't have any substantial issues to deal with down the road. Well, and thank you for that. But um, certainly uh, the invitation is out there also for you to come um, anytime, speak to our school board. Um, yeah. You know, we would uh, uh, like that, whether it's uh, before or after uh, the coming election. Mm -hmm. So issues that you, you've kind of touched on these things, you talked about some safety and law and order stuff, but do you see that as a real issue in the 30th assembly district? So uh, naturally, we had a front row seat to some of the challenges that were happening across the river in, in a variety of ways. And I know that we had neighbors. Uh, it was probably fairly, uh, um, fairly obvious. We had neighbors that were concerned that, you know, would some of the protesters, would some of the violence uh, spill over into our communities? Fortunately, it did not. And, but when I talk to people these days, there is – there's this lingering question, and I think there's a confusion on a lot of people's part. They're, they're not understanding. Protests are a good thing. You know, they're a rightful thing, but violence, you know, violence solving violence, that's not an answer, right? So many of the people I do talk to locally do have concerns, um, you know, depending upon what happens next in, 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 in our societies or what news breaks next and, and what are the triggering results. Fortunately for us, we have exceptional law enforcement locally. Um, great people. Um, I've done ride-alongs. I've talked to our local chiefs, uh, administrators, anybody I can to understand, you know, what's working, what's not working, what can we do better for you? Uh, what can you do better for our communities? These are very engaged, involved people. So while the concern I believe is valid, I think it's real. I think the right measures are being taken. And I think in our communities, we have the right people in those positions to ensure that um, our homes, our neighbors, our kids are protected. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming this, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway, is that there's been, um, you know, uh, talk about, well, accusations back and forth, this candidate or that candidate wants to defund police. But um, at this stage of the game and being a fiscal conservative and trying to keep government sp small, would you see this as an opportunity to maybe reduce our spending on public safety? No, no, absolutely not. I, I think that... <laughs> we have a high quality of life, you know, regardless. And, and I, you know, I'm probably optimistic by nature. I don't think you can maybe, uh, you know, be in business and, and not, you know, see that the glass is half full. But the reality is we live in a great area. Part of the reason we live in a great area is because we have great first responders across the board, our firefighters, our, our EMTs, our law enforcement. Defunding those folks in any way right now, I think would be one of the worst things we can do. In fact, I think we have, if, if, if any good, has come from some of the challenges of late, Jamie, we're recognizing that these folks, they live complex lives. I mean, there are people petrified running out of the door that they're running in. 
And so the challenges that they face, if anything in my mind, we've uncovered an opportunity here to look more carefully at, at, at the work that they do and ask ourselves the question, are we helping them enough? Are, are they, you know, is the stress too much? What can we do? What training can be offered here? Because at the end of the day, we need them in our communities to keep us safe. All right. So you would be more of an advocate to for refunding the police, if you will. Yeah. Reallocating resources to where it's most needed. Yes, I absolutely. So uh, along those lines um, of, you know, making priorities on different things, we've talked about, you know, public schools and uh, the university and so forth. Um, and you also want to have an economic development. I, I didn't hear in there and not, that you're purposely ignoring it, but just talk a little bit. What about broadband and why have we not, why do we still have many areas that don't have access? And this COVID thing has only accelerated and caused a deepening of that divide between the haves and the have nots in that regard. Why can't the legislature do something about it? Why has there been an inability to do that over the last four years? So, in my second term, we, have in, we increased funding another $30 million for broadband expansion across the state of Wisconsin. It is not enough. And you are spot on. Broadband is, is essential these days. It's not just for gaming or for entertainment purposes. It is for educational purposes. Um, when the CARES Act money was sent to the state, uh, I actually raised the subject um, with legislative leadership and proposed that we would use some of those funds and direct them towards a massive investment in broadband expansion across the state. Now, CARES Act money, as you know, had to be used for something that was related to the pandemic. My argument was very simply, um, absolutely, broadband is essential now because kids are at home. Uh, Mom and dad are working from home, those parents that could work from home. Um, Sadly, it wasn't picked up, but it doesn't mean we're going to stop trying here. This has put a spotlight. This time in our lives has put a spotlight on this need, Jamie. Broadband is essential. Um, If we can't use, because, you know, we still have some uh, unallocated CARES Act money, I'm going to keep advocating for this. I'm not done. But if that doesn't happen, when we enter the next budget, I think it is an absolutely worthwhile discussion to say, what can we do to accelerate this? Finally, the, the, the one underlying question there is what technology prevails because there seems to be some differing schools of thought at the state levels in terms of what happens there. My feeling is this, uh, of the top three or four technologies that can accelerate broadband dramatically to the homes across St. Croix and Pierce County, any one of them probably work just fine. Fiber is naturally going to be the most long-term, uh, reliable, high-performing option. But there's options even in the short term as we work up to that. So, you know, having a technology background, working in technology my whole life, it's, uh, it's near and dear to my heart. But I also see the absolute need for it here in our community. And I am committed to continuing that increase to make sure that we're solving that problem for our neighbors. Do you think part of this has been, um, you know, for those in the urban and suburban areas of the state, it's just not a priority because they already got it? Uh, well, you'd be, su- you'd be surprised, even in some of the suburban areas, it's not as good as we, 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 we think it is. Um, you know, that could be, I mean, dense, the dense population areas uh, have extreme, generally, have fairly fast uh, and robust broadband, and so kind of out of sight, out of mind. Issue, it wouldn't be the first issue that breaks down on rural versus urban, but no. uh, if there's ever an opportunity for bipartisan work, it would be all the legislators from those outlying areas like Western yeah. Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin, yep. to band together. Well, and I'll take it a step further because I would love to see gigabyte service across and greater across the state of Wisconsin. We spent a lot of time um, both looking at rural, rural health care, rural economic development, or some of the challenges that they're having from an economic development standpoint in our rural areas. Broadband helps that as well. Suddenly, when, when the rural areas of Wisconsin have access to high speed, you can tap workforce that you never could before. I mean, when, when St. Croix County, at the start of this year, is facing a 2% unemployment rate, I mean, that's a rounding error at that point in time. If you're willing and able, you can work. Employers potentially could gain access to, to labor in, in Barron County, maybe you would pick your, pick your Sawyer County, Northern counties. So there are a ton of reasons why this needs to be a top priority for the state of Wisconsin. 
All right. Now, earlier you mentioned uh, in that answer, you just said the magic word, which was the next issue I want to talk about, and that's healthcare, because mm-hmm. if because um, you previously talked about quality of life, and these are things that uh, that we want to have. And Wisconsin has been experiencing a population drain over the last couple decades. We're losing reg- representation in Washington, and um, we're losing just keeping our students. Uh, they graduate mm-hmm. and then they go out of state and go to other areas of the country. So yep. um, what can be done and, um, in the, along the lines of healthcare and, and does it start with accepting the Medicaid or uh, money um, from the federal government? So this question comes up and, and I continue to take the position and maintain the position that quote unquote free money from Washington is going to solve our problems. When you really dig in locally and speak with the healthcare providers, um, the answer is no, because what happens is this, let me use Arizona as one example. Arizona accepted the Medicaid expansion and within 12 months saw a 300% increase in hospital emergency department visits. Why? because people could just go there now. Um, And as we know, emergency department medicine and healthcare is one of the most expensive uh, uh, forms of healthcare that there is. When patients are presenting with that form of uh, healthcare, um, generally the healthcare provider uh, will be paid 60 cents on the dollar. So what happens is that deficit has to be made up somewhere. Well, it gets shifted over then to some of the private payers. That's not a sustainable answer. People should be afforded um, health care. We should, they should not be denied. And in Wisconsin, even if you're at the poverty level, you're not denied. You know, our silver plan in Wisconsin, for example, I believe it's Eau Claire County. If you're between 100 and 138% of, of the poverty level, uh, your premium is $15 a month. The tough part is uh, that the tough window are for those people who may, they're, they're out of that, but they're not quite high enough yet where, where it's, I'll say, reasonable for them to cover it. The marketplace is brutal. So what needs to happen is this as any good business would do, throwing more money at a faulty, complex, arguably in some ways broken system is not going to be the answer. Instead, and it's not easy, let's look at the cost structure of healthcare. Let's look at the inefficiency in the areas of healthcare. Let's look at where insurance maybe is influencing healthcare in some ways that are not favorable for those who need healthcare. Uh, That may be a difficult thing to do, but it's the right thing to do because just throwing more money at at, at the challenges are not the answer. I believe that, you know, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmacy cost reductions should be something that we, we go after. Transparency. I was on, signed onto a bill uh, this, this current cycle that required transparency with, uh, with prescription drug costs because you could literally find a pharmacy in Hudson that had a certain drug and they would sell it for, I'm just going to use an arbitrary number, $10. You could go 30 miles and find the same drug for $50. Why is that? That should not be the case. And so I think that there's things that we can and should be doing. Look, further leveraging our grandchildren's and our great-grandchildren's future is not the answer to a long-term strong state or nation. Okay. So I guess I've touched on some of the ones that are being raised um, well, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on and mm-hmm. ones that frankly people talk about. Um, uh, as you had mentioned that, you know, prior to COVID, we were hovering around 2% unemployment. But while that's great that that many people have jobs, some of them, some of those jobs though, were being held by the same person, meaning one person had to have two or three jobs just to make ends meet. And yeah. none of those jobs provided health care. Yeah. So how do we get that? I mean, it's um, without, you know, because it's, small business being the backbone of this district and yep. throughout our state, we got to make healthcare affordable for small businesses yes. and, and their employees. Yep. And I can tell you as an employer, it is one of the most difficult things when you see, I remember vividly working with my director of HR when we received our, our annual premium increase of 16%. And as an employer, you want to do everything you can for your employees but when you see increase, double digit increases every single year, at some point, it just gets very, very difficult. And so I think 
to my earlier point, there are things that can happen uh, structurally that can alter that. And those people who have multiple jobs, um, there could be a variety of reasons, right? You may you mentioned to make ends meet. Again, you know, using specifics here, depending upon where they fall on the income category, nobody should go without health care in the state of Wisconsin, period. Now, how affordable it is once you get above the poverty level, above 138% may vary, which is exactly why I said we've got to go after the cost because simply increasing more and throwing more money at it is not necessarily going to solve the problem. We've got to get to the root of it. And it's tough, but it has to be done. All right. With that, Shannon, we have to end. I want to give you the opportunity if you have a website or a Facebook page, what, what would it be? Um, ShannonZimmerman.com. I encourage everybody, um, go out, read up on me, uh, learn up uh, me. I'm, look, um, I'm a what you see is what you get guy. I've, I've enjoyed my 25 years uh, in this particular community. We live with great people, great kids. My kids are here. My grandchildren all go to school uh, here in this community. So um, my roots are here and my intentions are honorable and true. And as I said, this won't be a career for me. I've got a great career. This is something that I believe that I can take the life lessons I've learned running business, working with people in our community, understanding what their needs are, and apply them in Madison so that we as the fastest growing dynamic district can lead the state forward and be the answer and not more challenges for the state of Wisconsin. All right. Well, thank you. Shannon Zimmerman, uh, incumbent running for assembly this fall in the 30th assembly district. Thank you for being on the show. And I want to thank our uh, viewers for watching another segment of Western Wisconsin.